Hi, everyone. This year, my community orchard in Ben Nobleman Park in Toronto is looking absolutely beautiful. And that's due to the hard work of the volunteers. And they include three young, fantastic students from local schools who have joined us on Stewardship Days. Until now, the team has been really busy weeding around the fruit trees in the park. And last week, we were finally ready to feed our trees. We spread out two inches of quality compost, and we also added some biochar from the American Biochar Company and biofertilizer from Earth Alive. Hey, we all need good quality nutrition, and in our park, we make sure our trees get it. But we do have a serious problem in our orchard park, and that is something that our hardworking volunteers can't really fix, and that's poor quality soil. You see, our community orchard was planted on a site where there was once an apartment building. And in many areas, the soil is compressed. And that makes it really hard for tree roots to expand and for essential microorganisms in the soil to thrive. So what do you do if your fruit trees have been planted in poor quality compressed soil? That's what we're going to discuss in the show today. My guest is Glynn Percival. Her manages the Bartlett Tree Experts Research Lab Laboratory in the United Kingdom. And Glenn has been studying the impact of combining vertical mulching with worm technology as a way of improving tree health in compressed soil. Glenn, thank you so much for coming on the show today. No, it, it, it's a pleasure. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me back. So glad to have you back. And we're talking about soil and poor quality soil. So there may be a lot of people listening, Glenn, who don't even know what, what that means. How do you know right away that your soil is compressed or really bad quality? Is there a way you can find out without doing a soil test? Well, there is. And I was believing keeping things really, really simple. And uh, as I always say, when people ask me the same question, it, it comes down to one real issue. If, if you don't like digging it, trees don't like growing in it. So just go out there with the, you know, spade and fork. And if you're having issues turning the soil over, then that's a really good indication that the soil's compact. Yeah, now I can see that. And actually in our park, there's certain parts of the park where you start digging where we were hoping to plant a tree and it's like rock solid, it's so hard. So let's talk now about the tree's perspective. Here, you know, you've planted your tree in the soil that may be less than perfect. How will it actually affect the tree? Is it simply a problem with the roots not being able to push through? Uh, you know, let's get a little a close up view of how the tree feels about being in crummy soil. Yeah, th th that is pretty much in essence. There's, there's two major problems with a soil that, that is compacted. One is what we would term physical impedance to root growth, that the roots simply cannot push through the soil, that you can't get that, you know, nice big uh, spread of root system we want. And the other issue is, is because the soil is so compact, you've, you've squeezed all the oxygen out of it, or most of the oxygen, and obviously roots are alive and they need oxygen to breathe. And, and without that oxygen or with low levels of oxygen, it's, it's gonna influence how they grow. Just, just as it would us, you know, the oxygen levels go down and we struggle quite badly. So does any living organism. So that, that is the two main issues that, that we face. So, okay, we know that compressed soil, not a good thing. How, tell me what happened with you. How did you start your study? Like, how did this all come about that you started to study compressed soil? Well, I mean... Compressed soil in urban landscapes is, has always been a, a, a major issue. And, and it was really just constantly seeing, you know, going to these new building developments, going to construction sites, and even like, you know, a lot of supermarket car parks have lots of trees and they all look awful. They're all struggling. And it's just this issue of, of compaction. So that's kind of what really brought me into that area. And then we started to look at potential technologies that we could use to, to really overcome compaction. What works, what doesn't work? Because sometimes you can get some systems that really do work, but they're incredibly expensive. And of course, time and money then become factors. So it's a case of 
we'd love to use this technology, but it's too expensive. So maybe we can start looking at other ones, which is really where the kind of where the vertical motion came into play, because that is actually a, a relatively cheap and inexpensive way of decompacting soils. So tell me about vertical mulching. That's so interesting because we talk about mulching our fruit trees. Um, we do circles around the fruit trees, expand the circles out to the edge of the canopy to yeah. make sure that we can feed the roots. So there's no grass around, you know, our fruit trees, you know, up until the edge of the canopy. We put down beautiful compost. We might put wood chips on top. Um, and that's sort of mulching from the top. So maybe yeah. that's horizontal mulching. Um, yeah. That we'll call that horizontal mulching. But what what is vertical mulching, and how is it different? Uh, you know, the vertical mulching is is where we simply we would do a soil analysis. We would work out whether we do have a, a compact soil. We would send it away for analysis for its nutrient composition. Uh, again, would maybe look at its drainage. And if the soil really is very very poor we simply take out cores of soil and, and just take it away. And then we backfill. We put in a really nice, uh, we use a mix of, we, we, we buy a soil in the UK called John Innes. It's a very high quality topsoil. Uh, we would mix it with a really good kind of tree compost. We would put some organic matter in there. Really something that the roots are going to flourish in. We know they're going to, to thrive. So I want to, to get a little more specific. You talk about taking these core samples. So describe what that process looks like. Do you need a fancy machine? I mean, obviously with a shovel, you couldn't really make a long skinny, you know, hole in you without damaging the roots of your tree. So describe what are these core uh, samples? There's, there's two pieces of equipment you can use. One, if you do have the money, you can buy what we call a mechanical auger. It, it's in essence like a very, very large drill. It makes holes. Uh, you only need to go three inch wide. And we normally make them down to something like maybe 12 to uh, 15 inch below ground. So uh, you can either use a mechanical auger or there is another uh, you, an implement you can buy. It's called a Dutch auger. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. In essence, it, it really is like a giant corkscrew. And you can just put it on and you can just twist it round and round. And, and it is slower, but at the same time, it's far more inexpensive. So if you have a small area, it makes it economically feasible. And, and again, the Dutch auger will, will last for years. So let's talk about Stockley Park. That's where you did your experiment. And vertical mulching has been around for a while, I understand. Yeah. But what you did was something different. So tell us the story. Vertical mulching is, is actually frowned upon by the industry because really you are drilling holes under trees and it damages the root system. But Stockley Park is a business park and it's located on the peripheral edges of Heathrow Airport. But the dilemma is they have huge issues with uh, compaction. So all these thousands of trees are what we say they are surviving, not thriving and, and I mentioned uh, growth rate so on average they were growing like maybe two centimeters a year so in 10 years they will grow 20 centimeters which is about four or five inch you know it's really not much so the the problem was that there was such a vast expanse of area that decompacting everything was it was just impossible we couldn't do it so we sat down and we thought, well, can we have an alternative approach? And what happens if we have something like, say, a 500 square meter area with trees and landscape and it's where people sit and have, you know, they come out and they sit under the trees for the shade. You know, we can't decompact it all, but we can't afford to replace our trees. So I said, why don't we take pockets like islands within that area of, say, 20 square meters? And why don't we decompact it in such a way that in theory, once we've decompacted it, we can add things to the soil that will slowly move out and decompact the surrounding area. And, 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 and of course, in nature, what decompacts soil in nature? It's, it's worms. So we started to think about, well, why don't we start looking at adding, you know, worms, put them into these 20 square meter pockets, these little islands, 
make sure the soil is really well decompacted. We've got lots of organic matter in there. And then in theory, once the worms established, they're going to start to push out. They're going to move from that decompacted area. And, and, and the hope was that with time, these little islands, the worms would push out and actually meet up. So that's exactly what we did. And it was a great trial site because it allowed us to look at a whole range of soil amendments, as in such as biochar, such as slow release fertilizers, such as organic fertilizers. And what we found with vertical emulsion is for every, you know, we could do eight to 10 square meters of vertical emulsion in the time it took to do one using an air spade. So I'm not saying don't use an air spade because it really is a great tool. This was just a niche situation where we literally had thousands of square meters to decompact. So that was the premise behind it. And what we found over time is those worms are doing exactly what we wanted them to do. They are pushing out and that heavily compacted soil is slowly over time. This experiment's been running for three years. We want it to go for an, at least another two, but they are definitely pushing out and we're just seeing such, the trees are just looking so much better. As, as you mentioned, you referred to my PowerPoint where we have some really great photographs of trees that are in that decompacted worm amended soil versus trees that are still in the compacted soil. It's that's an amazing and exciting experiment and the pictures will be available for people to download when they go back to get the podcast of this show. I want to clarify. So you are putting in if you say, you know, however many square meters in that space, let's say what 5% of the square meters will be of the the holes that you're making. Yes. 5%, let's say. Now, you're making the holes and you will fill the holes with a mix of soil and compost and whatever appropriate amendments. Are you actually putting the worms into those holes? Uh, in some cases, we, we, we do. We actually add the worms. And in other cases, and I, I know it sounds absolutely incredible, but uh, the worms we, we actually use, they were native British worms, which, and, and I couldn't believe it existed, but we actually bought them off the internet. And, and I didn't realize you could buy worms, as in live boxes of worms off the internet. But you can, because they use worms for like composting, food waste, they use tiger worms. But these are specifically designed to decompact soil. So really, we just bought these boxes of worms and some we added directly to the hole. And in other cases, we made a bigger hole, amended the soil and just simply opened the box, gently put the box in the hole and then just covered up. I mean, there's, honestly, there's no real rocket science here. I sometimes feel a bit fraudulent as a scientist saying it's really that easy. We are just drilling holes and taking away the bad soil and replenishing with a good soil and adding worms. Now, obviously the worms in Canada, I don't know what the native worms are in Canada, but they will be different from the UK. Uh, but but in, in my situation, we just simply, as I say, literally got them off the internet and, uh, and, and did exactly what you've just said. Okay, so you've got a site, a large site, you've got your box of worms, are you expecting each worm to move for miles and miles or is your big hole quite close to the small holes, the vertical mulching holes, so that somehow, because they've got terrible soil to be working through. I mean, how are they going to do it? Even if you've got a hundred of them in a hole, they, they might just end up squirming around and hanging around each other, not going anywhere. You know, that's a great point. That's why I was really keen to emphasize the holes really have to be, you know, maximum 50 centimeters apart, which, which is half a meter, one and a half feet. If you make the holes too far apart, then potentially the worms will exhaust all those resources. And, and you've got too many worms in too small a hole or too great a distance, and they're not going to make it. So spacing is critical. So 30 to 50 centimeters apart, three inch deep, go down as i was saying you know 12 to 15 inches and and then add a, add a few worms and that's what gave us really good results obviously over time we may play around with the spacings but we know the system we have works 
really, really well. So we're staying with that. And as I say, we'll, we'll tweak it over time. Glenn, thank you so much for being with me on the show today. I love having you on the show. You're going to have to do some more research on something else amazing because we've got to get you back. Love being back on the show. It's, yeah. it's been an absolute pleasure and I will carry on doing lots more research.